Praise God. Amen. Amen. You guys. Father, we thank you for this time together in the house of the Lord, Father, to be joyful, Father, to celebrate the birth of Jesus, Lord, and to also just celebrate one another, Father, as we gather together after the service for our Christmas dinner. And Lord, I pray that you will just help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 We're going to be talking about defining moments today. Defining moments. And every one of us have defining moments in our natural lives. We have, well, let's talk about what is a defining moment. The dictionary says a defining moment is an event that typifies or determines all subsequent related occurrences. Now, let me put that in English terms. A defining moment is an event that takes place in your life that determines what's going to happen in the future. An event that takes place in your life that is going to determine what happens in your future. Now, the Bible says that first it's natural, we look at it in the natural, and then we look at it in the spiritual. So each one of us has a natural life. We get up in the morning, we go to work, we do our our daily routine, we have things that we do every single day in the natural, right? Well, we also have a spirit man living on the inside of us, and there is a spiritual application to defining moments, and that's what we're going to talk about today. When you're born, it's a defining moment. Hello, you are now in the world. You did not come with a manual. Your parents were probably looking at each other. Now what do we do with this child? How about when you graduate kindergarten? That's that's important to those kindergartners. They just got out of their first, you know, real school year. They're excited. What about when you graduate high school? Oh, what an accomplishment. We feel like we're ready to take on the world, and then we go to college. Some of us go to college. I actually went briefly. I took a typing class because I couldn't get the typing class when I was in high school. That's all I took in college, and God just blessed throughout the years. But most of us, a lot of us, go to college. What happens when you graduate from college? There's another defining moment. Now what do we do? We go get a job. Hopefully that's the event, right? I mean, we've got college students that are here off of, uh, they're they're on break now. So yes, when you graduate from college, you get a job. You start your career. You may actually have another defining moment in your life where you buy a house or move out of home or get a car or whatever. But there comes a time when you have to say yes, and I do to someone. You may get married. That's another defining moment. And then the cycle starts all over again. You have your own children, and it keeps going and going and going. Now, there's other defining moments along the way. If you cross the street and there's traffic coming, that could be a defining moment in your life. Don't you think? Yeah. Well, you know how I am about props. We have other defining moments. What happens when you don't brush your teeth? This is a defining moment, folks, in the natural. If you're brushing your teeth and you're taking care of your your mouth, you won't have a drill up in your head. That would be another defining moment that may not be very kind. We have to take care of ourselves in the natural, right? All right, you become a teenager. You start going through puberty. You have hormones going crazy. There's another defining moment. You better clean your face. If you're not cleaning your face, you can have some serious scarring, acne issues. Clean your face. That's a defining moment. We don't realize that as we're taking care of ourselves in the natural, 
we are actually doing something that is a defining moment because it's going to determine what happens in the future. What we do today affects our tomorrow. That's what Pastor Bob has taught us. Amen? All right. It is an addiction, I must confess. Sonic. Love Sonic iced tea. I make it at home. I buy the Sonic ice. It's the same thing. Louisiana, but I, I do the decaf. But anyway, all that aside, if you don't feed yourself, there will be a defining moment in your life. If you do not drink enough fluid, there is a defining moment when you're drinking. It's a defining moment because if you don't drink your water, you can die. Every single thing, every action that we do defines what's going to happen in the future. Every single thing we do defines our future. Don't mind if I do. Because you never know what somebody been put up in that class. I'm just kidding. Pastor Bob drinks out of this class and says, what'd you put in there? All right. If you treat your spouse with kindness, that is a defining moment because it affects your future. Okay? If you get to work on time and you do your job as unto the Lord, there's a, def there's a defining moment as you're working unto the Lord, you will probably keep your job. Now, just because I know, I know we've got people in here who have lost their jobs because their bosses were not godly, but as a general rule, everything we do affects our tomorrow. That's looking at it in the natural. Now, there are some defining moments in the spiritual. And this is what God showed me about this. A defining moment in the spiritual, and, I, and I, this is the one thing of all that I'll say today, if you can get this, a defining moment in the spiritual is when God speaks to you and you respond. Your response to what God says will define what happens in your life. But not only your life, but in the life of every single person that is around you. Your life can change an entire nation. We have thousands of people that watch our videos online. Thousands of people. I've got, we've got millions of people watching a video that was made praising God. Eight million. Eight million people. One person can affect Thousands, millions, billions, a whole nation. You know, God can turn the heart of a nation in how many days? Just like that. Over and over again in Scripture. A defining moment in the natural is when God speaks to you and your response will determine your future. But are you hearing from God? Do we know how to hear from God? A lot of times, we go through the business activities of being a Christian. We get up, we go to church, we come to church on Wednesday, we try to be kind, we try to do everything right, we try to be, you know, just as loving and caring as we can be, and then we mumble to God later, oh, Jesus, I can't believe they said that. And we have our meltdowns, which it's okay to talk to God. But if that's all we're doing as Christians, and we're not listening and responding, listening and responding, then we're not having a whole lot of defining moments in our Christian walk. When God speaks to us, it is our job to respond. Can I tell you, there are so many ways God can speak to us. And we can learn those ways right here. Every single way that God can speak to us is already shown right here in Scripture. And I do want to read a couple of those um, scriptures in just a moment. But the ways that God can speak to us, he can speak to us through the word of God. As we're reading it, it's washing us. It's revealing those areas that we need to either work on or maybe the areas we're doing well in. 
That is a defining moment when he speaks to us in his word. But what is our response? What is our response when we come into church and we hear Pastor Bob preach or one of the teachers here? Do we take what we've learned and pray about it and apply it in our lives as a stepping stone to the next defining moment? Do we listen to what our children say? You know, God can speak through children. As a youth pastor, I can tell you, I've learned more from them than they've learned from me. And I can honestly say that. We can learn from our spouses. We can learn from men, women, leaders, parents. We can hear the audible voice of God. Some of us don't ever want to hear that again because it is a defining moment for sure. It will shake you to your core. Some of us hear that still, small voice. But the question is, are we listening? Do we want that defining moment in our lives? Whenever Jesus came, he was sent here as a babe in a manger. And very few people really knew what kind of a defining moment that was. How this child was going to change everyone's life. Every person on the planet. You are called by God Almighty. You've got a calling on your life. Yes, ma'am, and you know it. There, is, there are those of you in here who know that you know that you're called. And when you know that you're called, there is a higher level of accountability in God. Hearing from him, obeying him. Hearing from him, obeying him. Having that defining moment, spending time with him, hearing from him, and obeying him will get you closer and closer and closer to the ultimate goal that God has called you to do. Amen? All right. We are going to take a walk through the word. How many of you were here when I did the walk through the word from Genesis to Revelation? Years ago, it's been a few years. Oh, it was so much fun. I really enjoyed that. Well, we're going to take a little bit of a walk through the word today. This is what the Lord says in Deuteronomy, and we can put this up on the board, please. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28, and amplified is fine. Behold, I set before you this day, a blessing and a curse. So we have a little bit of a choice there. Let's go to 27. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And the curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. So we have a choice today. We have a choice every day. Or we can make the choice one time. God, I'm going to follow you to the best of my ability with every decision that I have. This every day, well, I have to make this decision today whether I'm going to follow God. Well, maybe tomorrow I have to make this decision. No, make it once. Get it locked down in your spirit. I'm going to serve God till my last dying breath. Every single day. Am I going to make mistakes? Pastor Dan's known me for, since I was 18 years old. Yes, I'm going to make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes, but are we going to let that stop us from moving forward? If you're afraid you're going to make a mistake, what are you going to do? We're going to stay right where you are. We want to move forward. We don't want to be stagnant and staying in that one place in our life. We want to move on, growing spiritually. And what was uh, Darren talking about when he was here? Not being tossed to and fro anymore. Not just drinking milk like babes, but growing up into maturity. Growing up into maturity is having those defining moments when you hear from God and you obey. All right, let's look. Um, 
John 14, verse 15 and 21. John 14, verse 15. If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commands. It doesn't matter if it's coming from the word of God, from a pastor who's bringing correction into our lives, whether it's your friend, whether it's your child, or a donkey for that matter. The Lord can use anything to speak to us. Let's look at verse 21. And I will, 21, I'm sorry. But they will do, yeah, but they will do all this to you, inflict all this suffering on you because of your bearing my name. Okay, no, that's not it either. Maybe I wrote the wrong one down. Let me just read what I've got here. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Whoever obeys my commands that I give him. He who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. When we look through the scriptures, we see time and time again, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves, but be doers of the word, putting it into practice. We as Christians should fully obey God. We should not do what we think is right, but let God's wisdom and his instructions influence us in our decisions. Amen? Now, in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, it talks about by faith. Does it say by fear, Adam did this, or Eve did that, or Noah did this, or by fear? No. No. By faith. By faith. So these people heard from God, and by faith they did what God said. In their own strength? No. Let's go to Adam and Eve for just a moment. They had a defining moment. God spoke to them and said, You can eat anything you want in this garden, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do it. And what is the first thing they want to do? They ate. Got that defining moment. God spoke. God spoke. That was a defining moment right there. Now, choose this day didn't say choose tomorrow or the next day or over and over again for the rest of your life. Choose this day once and for all. Blessings or cursings, be obedient or not. Well, they chose to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what happened? Women, how many of you women have had children? We really want to talk about all the birth pains and everything. That Want to talk men about tilling the ground and the work that we've had to do because of that? There was a fall that took place. Not only did it affect them, it affected everybody. God spoke, they responded, and people were affected. That is how it happens in the spirit realm. We have our defining moment when God speaks to us. Let's talk about Noah. God spoke. Build an ark. I'm going to save you and your family from all this. God said, Noah responded. People were laughing at him, giving him a hard time. Well, you're building a boat out here? Ha, 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 how you going to drag that to the ocean? Bah, ha, ha. What is it, you know? What is this big thing? Is this your new house? Ha, ha, ha. And he kept doing what God said, because he had made a choice. And by his response to what God said, how many people were affected? Some negatively. But it spared his entire home. 
Every time you go to Hardee's and get your Hardy burger, that's because Noah saved that animal on the ark. Aren't you glad? I mean, really. He affected himself and his family and everybody else because of his defining moment. He chose to do what he was supposed to do. Amen. What about Moses? Oh, I got to read this one. Lord have mercy. I love Moses. We see his humanness, and we still love him. God said to Moses, and this is what he said in Exodus 14, 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide it. And the Israelites shall go on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Now, God told him what to do. Raise the rod and let, tell them, move forward. Man, they were stopped right there at the Red Sea trying to figure out what do we do. They're freaking out because the chariots, they can hear them. And he, God's like, this is your defining moment right here. God spoke, do this. Did he speak to everybody? He told Moses what to do. How many times in our life we feel like we're right at that, that place where there's a big old ocean in front of us, so to speak, and we got the enemy right on our tail. And we're like, what do I do? What do I do? I'm telling you one thing. I'm on my knees saying, God, I need a defining moment. You tell me what to do right now, because if I do what I want to do, I'm going to drown trying to swim across this water. But I want to know what you want me to do, because when we have that defining moment of him speaking and we respond, things happen. It's not in us. It's when he speaks and we respond just out of obedience. Well, God, I can't do that. Now, why would he go make your body the way he did and then tell you to do something that you can't do? If anybody knows how you're made and he knows our frame, it's him. He's not going to put too much on you you can't handle. Just walk in obedience. By fear? By faith. Just do it. So God said, lift up your rod, stretch it out over the sea and divide it. And the Israelites shall go on dry ground. Well, then Moses responded. He responded in Exodus 14, 21. He put the rod down on the ground. I can't do this. Is that what he did? No, no. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back. The Lord did it with a strong east wind all that night. It didn't just happen like Carlton Heston. I mean, that would be nice. That would be so dramatic and wonderful. I mean, the theatrics of that whole event. But by a strong east wind all that night. Oh, Lord, now there's water in front of us and the enemy, and it's windy outside. What am I going to do? Sometimes it gets a little scarier before the breakthrough. I got to say that again. Some of y'all didn't hear that. Sometimes it gets a little freakier and scarier right before the breakthrough. It's okay if it's a little windy. You know God's doing something. Amen? Amen. So here it goes. All that night made the sea dry land. I don't know about you, but when I walk out there in that water, it's pretty gushy under my feet. All the water. Whoosh, dry land. The waters being a wall on their right and their left. So God spoke. Moses responded. How did that affect the people? How did it affect him? How did it affect the people that were crossing? How did it affect those who were following him? When we have our defining moment and God speaks, things happen. And it happens in a mighty way. Not only did that water come through after they had crossed and kill 
all the Egyptians that were following him, the chariots, the horsemen, the whole nine yards, all destroyed. No more to follow him. But they were safe. They were safe. One person God spoke to. Some of you have family dynamics. Let's talk about family dynamics for a minute. Yeah, I heard that. Ugh. You may be the one in your family that God speaks to and says, this is how we're going to do it. And we say, oh, but aunt so-and-so or oh, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, they're just not going to understand. Well, you know what? It's not up to you to get them to understand. You don't have to explain yourself. You have your defining moment. God speaks, and his word does not come back void. It goes forth to accomplish that which he sent it to do. When we hear from God, just do it. Just do it. Like supernatural kicks in. You feel that unction of the Holy Spirit, and you go forward. You know what uh, Joyce Myers says? Just do it afraid. If you're afraid when he tells you to do something, just do it afraid because you're doing it by faith, not fear, not fear. Now, Moses had another defining moment in his life where God spoke to him. This defining moment affected his life forever, and it wasn't a good choice that he made. It was very sad, actually. In Numbers 20, in verse 2, it says that there was no water for the congregation. All these people across the Red Sea, they're just kind of out there now. No water. And so they assembled together against Moses and his brother Aaron. They were doing what? What do you think they were doing when they assembled together against them? Oh, you think? They were just whining. I'm thirsty. You brought us out here to kill us. See, first of all, they were thinking Moses and Aaron brought them out there to kill them, right? to let them die in the desert. They had forgotten who actually took them out. They were looking at man. God brought them through that. But God will use us to help bring others through things. And they will want to look at you and come against you if you don't do everything they expect you to do. All you need to do is obey God. What is that you say? It's simple, not complicated. Just obey God. Who do we have to answer to? Does that mean I'm an island to myself and I don't need any of y'all? No. I need every single person in here. We're part of each other. We're part of a body. So God tells him, God tells Moses, and this is in verse 7 of Numbers 20, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock, speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will give forth its water. So God spoke. What did Moses do? Let's drop down into verse 10. And Moses and Aaron, they assembled the congregation. They did part of what God said. They stood before the rock. And Moses said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Now, you might want to say that with God tells you to speak. Don't do that. Name calling is never a good thing. Hear you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted his hand and with the rod smote the rock. Twice. Remember, before this event, he was told to smite the rock to give them water. This time, God wanted him to speak. There are certain results that will take place only if we obey exactly what he asked us to do. What was working yesterday isn't going to work today. We need a fresh word from God, fresh hearing from God. And Again, do we know how to hear from God? The Bible says that my sheep will know my voice. 
My sheep will know my voice. Do we know his voice? Or are we still babes who don't really know who's holding me? You know, I'm three months old and I don't know. Oh, yeah, you're my mommy. Oh, wait, you know, you're my mommy. Or are we growing up and learning to hear his voice? Because, you know, sometimes us mamas can give the look. We don't need to speak. We just give the look. And they know that's mama, and I'm not doing that anymore. As we grow up in God, can, can I tell you, we will have God give us that look. You will feel it. You will know. And it's like, okay. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, I'm talking to the right crowd. <laughs> so here's Moses. He strikes the rock because he's mad. He had an anger problem, man. You rebels. He starts hitting the rock. Well, because of God's love for the people, he allowed the water to flow. But this is what happened. Drop down into verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in, rely on, cling to me to sanctify me in the eyes of the Israelites. See, this was an opportunity to sanctify God in the eyes of the Israelites. You therefore shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. What? I thought that's why I went to, uh, back to Egypt to begin with, is to lead these people out and into their promised land, and you're telling me I can't go in now? Talk about a defining moment. God spoke, Moses responded, and it affected him, but it affected everyone else because now Joshua's got the responsibility. When we don't do what we're supposed to in our defining moments, God's going to get the job done through somebody else. I have said this more than once up here. Yes, I'm praising worship leader. Yes, I lead the youth. Yes, we have a creative arts department. Do I enjoy doing those things? Absolutely, hands down, as a teacher, I love doing these things. But bring me one person that's called, and you can do what God's called you to do. And I'll be there 100% to support you in it. Let God, everyone say that, let God, let him speak to us. Sometimes we get so busy and all, I don't want to hear, ah, you know how kids get sometimes, you know, they don't, they, they're playing or whatever and they start getting picked on and the little kid will be sitting there going, ah, la, 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 I can't hear you, la, 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 la. Do I do that? Yeah, I do that to you sometimes, don't I? But let God speak, amen? All right, so not a very good moment for Moses. It affected his destiny, but it also affected Aaron's because it does say in that verse 12 that ah, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, you will not bring this congregation. Wow, have you ever thought about that? We know where Moses was buried, but whatever happened to Aaron? That's just a little tidbit for you teachers that want to dig that out. All right. Now, his brother Aaron, Lord have mercy. You know, God had just spoke through Moses and told everybody, God spoke, don't have any other gods before me. No other gods before me. So then here goes Moses up on the hill, on the mountain, I call it the hill. He goes up on the mountain, and he's waiting to hear from God on the mountain. He's got Joshua with him too, by the way. Here's Aaron down there with all the people. Now, Aaron is Moses' brother, so he's kind of the spokesperson now because Moses has been gone for a little while. And they start complaining, well, we don't have a God to honor. We don't have anybody to worship. And what does Aaron say? We will wait. We will wait for God to speak. Moses will be back. Does he stand? No. Give me your earrings. Give me your bracelets. Give me all your stuff. And out came this calf. That's the way he said it in scripture. Out came this calf, Moses. I, did, I just, you just came out of the fire. Really? And so Moses hears, and Joshua hears what's going on. 
they're not just bowing down to this calf. They're partying. They're doing things I'm not going to say. They're having themselves a good old time in the flesh. God spoke. Do not have any other gods before me. Because if you do, you will not heed my voice and obey because you'll be drawn away by every wind of doctrine and everything that's out there. But God spoke. Aaron responded. What caused him to do that? The Bible's very clear about this. What caused him to do that? I was afraid of the people. I was afraid of the people. I will have to say, Pastor Bob and Susan, their love for us, how many of y'all know that they love us? They have walked the walk. They are not afraid of the people. They fear God rather than man. They will stand with you. They will speak life. They will speak truth. If you need to hear from God and you're struggling in an area and you're looking in the word and you're praying and everything and you just need to hear fresh, your pastors, they're here for us. Amen? God spoke, don't have any other gods before me. Aaron responded, what happened because Aaron did not obey his defining moment? Exodus 32, verse 24. Yeah, I better get my other paper. I actually, we're going to go farther than that. Sorry about that, Scott. Um, yeah, we'll start there. Sorry. 24. Exodus 32, 24. I said to them, and this is Aaron kind of giving his excuse to Moses. Those who have any gold, take it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were unruly and unrestrained, for Aaron had let them get out of control so that they were, in, they were a derision, an object of shame among their enemies. Verse 26, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. This is, this is just like, wow, I cannot even imagine He stood at the gate of the camp, and he said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, let him come to me. If someone stood in the middle of a stadium that was filled with people and said, If you're on God's side, come to me right now. How many of us would have enough guts to get up and say, I serve the Lord, I'm down there right now? I mean, some of us like have to look around our shoulder. Well, who's going to watch me? Do they know me? Do they put me on the camera? You know, We get more concerned and we fear people more than we do God. I know, I'm down, man. Come to me. And the Levites, the priestly tribe, gathered together to him. And then Moses said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Every man put his sword on his side and go out, are you ready? From gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man, his brother, every man, his companion, every man, his neighbor, and the sons of Levi did according to the word of the Lord. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Defining moments, folks. Oh, well, I'm not Aaron. I don't have this many people following me. I'm not Moses. I don't have that many people following me. I'm not a pastor, and I'm not this, or I'm not that. But guess what? You are the chosen few. And you may not think you've got this crowd following you, but my 10-year-old son knows that what he does will affect every single person that comes after him. He said that to me one day, Mom. He says, Mom, so what I do right now will affect my grandchildren? 
and them. Uh, oh, yeah? Out of a 10-year-old. We don't realize how many people we really are leading by our defining moments and what we choose to do. Verse 30, the next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. He was always trying to intercede for them every time. You know, he really did love them. He really did want God to have mercy on them. Partly, I think, because he himself wanted mercy for himself because he had learned that, that God was a merciful God. And then in verse 35, if that wasn't enough, and the Lord sent a plague upon the people because they had made the calf which Aaron fashioned for them. So some people would read this and say, oh, God is so horrible. He had them kill their families. Did they really, were they the ones who really did that? Or was it their choice in their defining moment to follow what they chose? They were given an opportunity to stand with Moses, and they still stood on the other side. They still chose to do the wrong thing and have a curse. I honestly believe that we as Christians, how many of you in here are Christian? You know what Christ, Christian means? Christ follower. Christ-like, Christ follower, someone who wants to do God's will. And when we make decisions in our lives, it does affect other people. I have got an entourage of people throughout Scripture and what they have done and how their lives have affected others. And I'm going to pick just a few more to go through. But Joshua, because of what Moses did, Joshua ended up having to go into the promised land with these, these people. And God spoke to Joshua, and he said what? Be not afraid. Did he say it once? Over and over and over again. What is our biggest enemy? Not just our minds, but fear. Fear. Afraid of people. We're in the grocery store. We see someone shopping. And, we're, and we feel this urge to talk to them and just say hello and try to encourage them because you see how downcast they are. And we kind of, oh. I'm going down the other aisle because, Lord, you're trying to. We, if you start thinking about it, that's going to be your worst enemy right there is thinking about it. Just do it. You are a king, a priest. Now, if you walked into Bilo with your long train and your crown. Whoa. Oh, hi, how you doing? <laughs> nice to meet you. I don't care. I'll talk to anybody when I got that on. Well, you are. You're an ambassador for God Almighty. You've got the authority of God. The authority of God on you. Walking in that authority when you know that you know that you know that you're forgiven of every sin. One sin, two sins, no. Every sin you've ever done, everything you've ever done wrong, when you receive Christ, it's gone. So he didn't just pay for your past sins, your present sins, but every sin that you would commit in the future, it's paid for. You are a king. You are a priest. Now y'all are going to be looking in the mirror. Get that crown on your head just right. <laughs> yes, I know who I am in Christ. God loves me. Say, God loves me. Do you believe it? That's what I hear. All right, that's a good thing. That's right. And even when you don't believe it, still say it, because eventually it's going to drop down in your spirit, and then look out, world. That's right. Amen. Amen. God can use each other, your parents, your leaders. Did you know he can also use animals? Y'all are like, Lord, have mercy. has your cat talked to you today? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, we have got our story of Balaam and his donkey. A lot of you are already familiar with Balaam and his donkey, because anytime I've ever talked about animals, I've got to bring up Balaam and his donkey. 
there was a leader of a country who saw how powerful the Israelites were. And this man was not happy because he did not want the Israelites to come up on top of his country and destroy him. So he's looking for somebody that knows the word of the Lord to speak a curse on the Israelites. So he can be all that. So who does he call but Balaam? Hey, Balaam. He summons him. He sends his little peons out there to get him. And he's like, oh, no, I ain't going. I'm not going. I'm not going. You know, Balaam prays. God says, don't do it. Don't do it. He doesn't go. Well, now this leader's getting even more upset. He sends even his best leaders to bring him on. And Balaam's like, no, 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 I don't know about all that. So Balak is the name of this, this king of the Moabites at the time. So I'm going to drop down, and you don't have to tur- put this up there yet, Scott. He keeps doing this over and over again. And in Numbers 22, verse 12, and God said, now remember, God speaks, we respond, it affects people. God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said to those princes of Balak, go back to your own land, for the Lord refuses to permit me to go with you. So this kept going back and forth. And God came to Balaam at night. Again, these people came, you know. And he said to him, how many of you guys know God really likes to talk to us at night? And here he's awaking you up, 3 o'clock in the morning. Lord, why am I awake? Most of us want to turn over and go back to sleep. But if you ever wake up in the middle of the night like that, just sit up and ask him, Lord, did you have something you wanted to speak to me? You will be surprised. God sped, said, or God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the men come to call you, if they walk in and call you again, then rise up and go with them. But still, only speak what I tell you to. So what did Balaam do? God told him what to do. Balaam just rises up in the morning and saddles his donkey and went. If they call upon you again. They didn't call upon him again. He just got up and said, okay, let's go. Uh Uh-oh. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way as an adversary against him. Remember, he's riding his donkey. He's going along. The donkey sees the angel of the Lord with a sword out, and he starts moving over. Man, I'm not going into that. Are you crazy? And, of course, you know, here's Balaam. Get, oh, get, oh. And he's still crashing him into the rocks and everything. So Balaam's getting mad. He's swatting his donkey, giving him a hard time. Three times. Balaam was angry with his animal. I don't know about you, but if a donkey looks in my face and starts talking, this isn't Shrek here, okay? I will run. I I don't know that I could stand there. But he talks to the donkey. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she, now we know that the donkey was a she, said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you should strike me these three times? The donkey thinks that Balaam knows and sees the same thing she sees. The Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And what did Balaam do? He bowed with his face on the ground. I think I'd be doing that too. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? See, I came out to stand against you and resist you, for your behavior is willfully obstinate and contrary. Contrary to what? What God said. We wonder why we have so much struggle in the spirit realm with demonic influences. Because we're doing something contrary, and that's not always the case, because sometimes the enemy just attacks us because he likes to, but because there might be something contrary in our lives that we're not quite right with God in. Well, Balaam did the right thing. He got on his face. 
And the donkey saw me and turned from me these three times. If she had not turned from me, surely I would have slain you and saved her life. Wow. Talk about humbling. You're not all you think you are, Balaam. Save a donkey. Wow. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the way against me. But now, if my going displeases you, I will return. Sometimes we think we're doing what God told us to do. We really, really think it. But deep in our spirit, man, we know something's not quite right. But we still go. God will stop that in a skinny minute. But are we willing to humble ourselves as Balaam did? I'm sorry, I repent. I was doing the wrong thing. I'm so sorry. I'll go back now, man. I'm not going forward. (laughs) I'll return back to where I came from. Well, Balaam did go, and he did speak to Balak, and he did tell Balak exactly what God said, which was nothing but blessings for Israel. Over and over and over again. Can you imagine what King Balak of the Moabites was thinking? Here I called you out to curse these people so I can have this great nation, and you came out here and bless them even more. We have people in the world today who will call you on your phone and say, I need you to come over here right now because such and such is giving me a hard time. And I need you to come over here and pray with me. And they want you to come into agreement with their negative slant towards whoever they're talking about. Because they want you as the Christian to bring a curse on them. It it, it really is a twisted thing. But that is what they'll do. We have got to be careful who we join ourselves to. There has to be a defining line I'm going to say that, a defining line. There are boundaries. There are boundaries, and those boundaries are not to hurt us. Those boundaries are to keep us alive, like crossing a busy street. We don't want our kids to do that. But God has a plan, folks. He speaks, we respond, and things happen. As you read through your Bible, as you look at these stories, each story has those elements in it. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't been reading your Bible, pick up your Bible. Read some of these stories that you remember as a kid if you're not real sure where to go to. Look up Noah. Look up, you know, whoever you need to and look at their life because you will learn how our lives are to be lived. I like learning from other people's mistakes. I mean, not that I want them to make a mistake, but I've made enough of my own, and I'm really grateful to learn from someone else's mistake. (laughs) Oh, I've got one more. Well, I've got multiple stories, but I really just have the one more. Y'all know about King David. Actually, I have two more. I'm going to tell you about Nahum, too. We're going to talk about King Saul briefly. Is King Saul... No, I want to go to Paul. All right, let's talk about Nahum, then I'm going to talk about Paul. Nahum was the commander of the army of the king of Syria, and he was a fantastic warrior. But he had leprosy. He had leprosy. And the Bible says that he has this this messenger, this servant, that is very concerned for him and encourages him to go and and have the king, you know, speak blessings over him. And then the king's like, who do you think I am? I can't do that, you know. So finally he ends up with Elisha. He goes to Elisha's house. Elisha is who? He's a prophet. So Nahum goes to this prophet, and he's expecting the prophet to come out. You know, we have these expectations about how "Mm, God's going to speak. God's speaking to me right now. You know, we have these expectations instead of just walking, walking in our life and letting him speak the way he wants to speak. But he expected 
Elisha to come running out of his house and lay his hand or wave his hand over that area and heal him. But God, God spoke through Elisha, through a messenger to Nahum. There are many messengers in this room, and I want you to know I'm listening because I'm listening what God may be speaking to me through you. Here's Nahum. He looks at the messenger, and the messenger says, oh, I got a word for you. Praise God. Elijah said, go down to the nasty River Jordan and dip about, you know, ten times, and then you'll be fine. Have a nice day. He's the commander of the Syrian army. He's in a high position. I'm not going to go dip in some muddy, nasty ditch. But that's what God said. So he's angry because God didn't say what he expected. What he expected wasn't the thing. Our expectations will keep us from hearing clearly from God. Had God, I mean, and, and his servant's like, hey, he didn't ask you to do a hard thing. Just, just go do it. Just, just go. It's okay. Just do it. You know what, was, what he was dealing with more every time he went in that water? His pride. His pride. He came out because he obeyed. Well, someone had to help encourage him to obey, and we need to help each other encourage each other to obey. But God spoke, he responded, and he's healed. He was healed. How many of you know he lost all his dignity that day? Because when he came out of that water and he was clean, there was no pride there. He was excited. That man was probably dancing all over the place in that muddy water. He could have cared less who saw him. He was healed of leprosy. Do you know how that stinks? Not just stinks, but stinks. Do you know that that's rotting flesh? Do you know the pain involved in that? This man was healed because he responded to his defining moment. He responded. He responded. Absolutely amazing. Jonah. Oh, Jonah. Wow. Paul. And I'm going to leave you with this because I do believe that these last days that we're living in, I'm looking at our leaders here. I'm looking at leaders don't be looking behind you. I'm looking at you because you are called. You are anointed. Say, I'm called. I'm anointed. I am a minister of God. Now, you may not have your little ordination certificate on the wall, but you are, an, you are a minister of God. You minister to him. God created Adam and Eve because he longed for fellowship. Isn't that what all of us want? It's just somebody to understand what we're going through, what we've been through, our hurts, our pains, our, our sorrows, our, our happiness, someone to share it with. Some of y'all in here have never lost a spouse, but some of you have. And just to have somebody to call you and say, come on over for dinner, or can I stop by for a minute and see you? Some of us don't realize what each other are going through. You know why? Because we don't want to talk about it. I'm coming to church and I will go home. I, I mean, I mean, I'm, am I being real? I mean, I'm, that's honest. I'll come in here like the little dog on the dash. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Everything's fine. Great, fine, wonderful. Okay, now I'm going home and going to sleep and every bit of what I'm going through is going to sleep with me. We need to be real with each other and feel safe. And the way to do that is to draw closer to him because as we are all drawing closer to him, we're getting closer to each other. Amen? Defining moments. Let him speak to you. Say, let God. Let God. All right. Paul and Ananias. Five minutes. I love this story. Here's Paul. Stoning. 
killing, murdering Christians, thinking he's doing the right thing. He really did think he was doing the right thing. His heart was right. I'm serving God. These people of the way are wrong. And God saw a heart of a man who would do whatever it took to serve him, even if he was doing it wrong. And what did he do? Knocked him off his horse. Some of us are on our little high horse. We need to be taken off. Hey, been there. This is what uh, God said to Paul when he was on the ground when the light came and blinded him and he fell off of his horse and he's laying on the ground. God spoke and said to him, Arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. There's his first step of faith. He has no idea what he's going into the city for. Paul responded. Now, along the way, he has a vision of this man Ananias praying for him and bringing healing to his eyes. But Paul responded, and he went into the city, and he sought out Ananias and looked for Ananias to lay hands on him to bring him sight. And after he regained his sight, here's the response and how it affected. God spoke, told him to go. He was obedient and went. And then, after he took in some food and was strengthened, for several days afterward, he remained with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately, in the synagogues, he began proclaiming Jesus. Immediately. Okay, this is the guy who was just killing them. And now he's preaching Jesus? Wow. I love Ananias. Because Ananias is uh, he's a little freaked out by the idea that God told him he had to lay hands on Paul. Isn't he the one who's stoning everybody? And so God speaks to Ananias. Get up and go to the street called... Ah, straight, good. And... Ask at the house of Judas for the man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is there praying. So God didn't just bring Paul to Ananias. Ananias had to obey God and go down the street called Straight, knowing that this murderer who's killing Christians is inside and where he is. God's defining moment. He spoke to him and told him what to do. Oh, but, 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 but. Oh, how many of you have done that? Uh, uh, scary. And then Ananias is so gentle. He's, so, he's like, you know, I've heard many people tell about this man, especially how much evil and with great suffering he's brought on your saints, God, in Jerusalem. And God said, go, because this man is a chosen instrument of me. And he will bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and descendants of Israel. So Ananias responds. He does exactly what God said. He prays for him. The scales are removed. The blindness leaves. And now Paul can see. And who was it in here who made the statement this past week about him? He could see, but he couldn't see. And then when he couldn't see, he really saw. Wow. Who wrote the majority of the New Testament? Ananias is my hero. Yes, Jesus is my real hero. But out of his obedience, by fear, by faith. But if you're afraid, just do it afraid. Because it's still faith if you're still doing it. So be encouraged. I would like to encourage you, if you have not heard from God, or you have heard from him before, but it's like, I heard from him 
a month ago, or maybe it's been a year ago, or maybe it's been longer than that. God's desire is to speak to us. He wants fellowship. None of the animals he created satisfied that longing desire he had for relationship. None of them. Our defining moments are brought on in our relationship with him. He speaks, we respond, lives are changed. Say, God speaks, we respond, and lives are changed. Every single story. I want to encourage you, find a story in the Bible this week. Just start there. Just find a story and start reading it and see how each of those steps were made in each of those stories and how you can learn from someone else's mistakes and make good choices. Ask God to speak to you. Let's all stand to our feet. I know Pastor Bob has a couple things he wants to share, but let's stand to our feet and let's just pray. Say, Lord, I want to hear from you. I want to know you more. I want to be obedient. I want more defining moments in my life opportunities to do the right thing, to change the lives of everyone around me, everyone behind me, everyone in front of me, beside me, everywhere I go, for your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I believe that God has spoken to every person in here, and therefore you need to respond. And you may be here, uh, and you've never really made that first commitment to Jesus Christ is to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Uh, St. John uh, one twelve says, as many as receive. You know, we can know something about the historical Jesus but we're talking about the resurrected Lord, his spirit, we can receive by faith. And the Bible says, as many as receive him, God gives them the power, the authority to become sons of God. And if you're going to inherit the promises of God, you've got to first come into his family. Amen. Think about that. And when you come into his uh when you receive him, you come into his family, then all the promises of God are for you. If you're not a son, a child of God, if you're still a child of the devil, that's what the Bible says, the promises of God are no good except this. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're here, you would never made that commitment. I'm not talking about just walking down the aisle and speaking some words and going back and living for the devil. That is not going to work in these last days. It's got to be a total, absolute commitment to Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all, or he's not Lord of anything. And if you don't make that type of decision, then you'll always be to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. So I'm honest with you. I've got enough experience in watching people's lives that just in and out, in and out, uh, uh, just not living the victorious life because they're really not totally, absolutely surrendered to Jesus Christ. And we simply say, is he going to be Lord? If he's Lord, then you will obey him. And it's not hard because he'll give you the Holy Spirit to empower you to follow him. Now, some of you may have drifted off. Uh, we want to drift you back. So you need to just come up. Just come up right now and by you coming up, you're signifying something, and we'll pray with you. If the Lord has spoken, respond. It's, this is your moment now. This is your moment to change your future. This is your moment. You know what the Lord wants you to do. You're struggling right now. Just obey. Well, God, that's it. Yeah. And I want to say this. And this, uh, this message has washed us. It has given us direction. And as your pastor... I make a fresh commitment that Jesus Christ is Lord of every area of my life. And if I fail, I'll be just like you. I'll go to 1 John 1, 9 and say, God, I'm sorry. I repent. I confess. 
and I receive your forgiveness and your cleansing right now. So this is your moment. And if God is not speaking to you, go ahead back and eat your meal. Would you all minister to Floyd? If you need to come, you come now. If you don't need to come, then just go back and 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 uh, eat your eat your feet. You need to come, come. This is your uh, refining moment. This is it. You come, Susan. But you're not here with this young lady. If you need to come, some of you would come up. Yeah, come on up. Charles says, come up, and people come up. You can minister to them. Others can go back and finish it. You feel good. You feel this. Your, ref, your refining moment is to go back and eat. Go back and eat. That's your refining moment. But if it's to come up here, make that total, absolute commitment that Jesus is going to be Lord of all. Now, the devil won't want you to do that, so you come. You come. In Jesus' name, you come. Come, you come. And for me. Absolute Lordship of Christ. Only you can make that decision. And the Holy Spirit will honor it. He will see. You who are weary, come home. Earnestly. If you didn't bring anything to eat, we got plenty of food back there. Just go on back to the other building and uh, and start eating and say your say your uh, grace. Father, we thank you for the food right now in Jesus' name. We thank you for the people that brought it, and we thank you for this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You need to come. You come. This be your refined this moment, refining moment. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you. Love you, brother. And ah, for nah. me. Who's be the head? That's right. <laughs> That's right.